Good day, good friends. Uh, welcome back to uh, our program, In the Eyes of Truth. Uh, today we have uh, a new guest with us, uh, Andrea uh, Lucidi. He is an Italian uh, journalist and war correspondent uh, who is uh, been, who spent quite a bit of time uh, in the Donbass uh, and is telling the other side of the story, not the NATO uh, propaganda side, but the reality of what uh, is happening on the ground. Uh, today we're going to discuss... Uh, how he, what brought him here, uh, what he's seen, uh, and how things are uh, standing in Italy as far as uh, the the people's view on uh, the conflict that's going on in Ukraine. Andrea, uh, please. Dear friends, are you worried about what's going on on the American market? Are you paying attention to the death spiral uh, that the American debt has taken on? Every four months, $1 trillion gets added to the debt. And as we know, that uh, four months is now turning to three months. And it will turn to two months. And it will turn to every month. It's called hyperinflation. If you're paying attention, you should be worried about that your hard-earned money, the treasures that you've uh, stored up, the inheritance that you may be getting from your parents or have gotten from uh, previous generations is all going to be destroyed. Now, gold, gold is always the bulwark against such inflation. But if you think about holding that gold in the United States, you're going down the wrong path. Let us remember 1932, 1933, when a G-man stood in every bank ready to take that gold away and give worthless uh, money, worthless paper money. It happened once, it will happen again. That's why you should come visit the site of my friends at Exit Strategy World. They're going to help you find that safe harbor, that place that you can put away that gold in a jurisdiction that uh, greedy politicians and spendthrifts can't reach. They're going to help you find that strategy, and they'll help you get that ever, ever vital second passport. Because without a second lifeline, you're a prisoner in whatever nation you happen to be in, and you are a prisoner at the whim of any politician that comes to power. You should always have that exit strategy. The exit strategy globally, the world. So come visit our friends at exitstrategy.world. Gold, the currency of kings. A safe harbor in times of war and fiat currency mass destruction. At exitstrategy.world, our team can help you vault gold in the safest offshore jurisdictions for citizens of the Eurasian Economic Union nations, including in Dubai and Hong Kong. Exitstrategy.world. Create your own free world. Welcome to the show. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself uh, and how you wound up in uh, Donbass. So, hello. Thank you for thanks for your invitation. I uh, come in Donbass in November uh, 2022, uh, some months after the beginning of uh, the Russian special operation in Ukraine. Uh, I was uh, in uh, the Belgorod and Kharkov region uh, during the month of August. Uh, of 22 for my first uh, war reportage from uh, uh, Russia and Russian control zones. I choose to come here uh, do this can be a, a very long story but I try to uh, make shorter <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, when I was in the university my topic uh, was uh, the foreign volunteers in Waffen SS and the collaborationism on Soviet area. For this reason, I learned a lot about uh, Ukrainian nationalists because during the Second World War, the, um, the part that uh, you, the Ukrainian nationalism played uh, in the war in East Europe uh, was uh, very important for the Nazi Germany. And uh, Unfortunately, is a capital of this history that is uh, underestimated, and uh, not a lot of historians and uh, researchers are interested in. For this reason, uh, when I was uh, writing my dissertation, uh, I encountered some uh, similarity between the propaganda of this uh, Ukrainian nationalism during Germany occupation of Ukraine and the propaganda that uh, some military uh, 
sector or military unit like Azov, Aidar or Donbas make it uh, since 2014. I saw this similarity and uh, I was I was in Berlin for write my dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, I was shocked because uh, nobody in Europe who had was interesting in such topic in the same Europe, in the same liberal Europe that uh, uh, spoke a lot about uh, the problem of the rights extremism in Germany, in Italy, in French, about, uh, for example, FD in Germany or the Le Pen movement in France or uh, Meloni in Italy. But I, I thought, why they are not speaking about this clear neo-Nazi problem in Ukraine and about such units, military units that are from some far-right militia that was integrated in Ukrainian army. For me, it was a, a ter terrible. And I start to learn about it. Uh, during the time I organized and I was invited for present my work in some a lot of international conference in the University of Bologna, the University of Bielefeld in Germany, for example, uh, where I studied, I present my dissertation and where I spoke about the war in Donbass and the problem of the neo-Nazis in the Kiev's army. So in f since February 22, nobody wants to speak about it. Yeah. A lot of journalists start to speak about the situation in Ukraine and Donbass as a big expert, also people that uh, maybe one, two months uh, before the beginning of the special operation cannot indicate Donetsk or Lugansk on a map or Ukraine <laughs> on a map. But They're American. After... <laughs> 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 but after uh, the beginning of special military operation, they start a lot of experts uh, start to speak about it on Italian TV, on newspaper, um, and I was shocked because nobody asked an opinion to a historian prof a professor in the university, for example, or uh, to war correspondent that was there in the past years, and when someone start to speak about his experience and say, yes, I was in Donbass, but the situation, it's not like you pretend to present it. These people was muted by the system. So they was not, uh, they, they cannot make new, new program in the TV. And I remember, for example, the state channel correspondent uh, uh, from Moscow, one time he said that uh, uh, President Putin asked about uh, a new um, peace deal with NATO. And for this reason, the Italian parliament accused him to be pro-Russian journalist and the state channel moved him from Moscow to Cairo in Egypt. <laughs> Why? Yeah. But uh, for this reason, uh, I start in February 22 to make a little bit information on social media. Uh, I would like to share my knowledge about history uh, of the collaboration of uh, Ukrainian nationalists uh, with Nazi Germany, etc. But I, uh, I saw that this was not enough for have a big auditorium because a big um, public because uh, you know I'm alone mm, I was without any media uh, I tried to wrote some articles for some academic articles for uh, some scientific journal but the, this was not not enough uh, who in the between the people can read a scientific article of 12 20 pages with note and reference nobody of course and if you want to share another perspective you need to stay on the field and try to produce some content that the people can find interesting so i i choose to come here in russia and i go after maybe after three 
days after my arrival, I come to Lugansk. And I choose to uh, make Lugansk as my permanent base. So I lived uh, almost two years there. Yeah, Lugansk is uh, actually my birth city. So uh, I was. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, um, a bit familiar with the city. Yeah, it, what's interesting is, you know, that, that what you hear a lot of from the West, from the uh, contradicting uh, arguments, well, Ukraine cannot have Nazis. It can't be a Nazi regime. The president is Jewish. And then you say, but the president also made Bandera the national hero in his birthday. And then they look at you, and, and who's that? Uh, and, and absolute total lack of any any knowledge of Ukrainian history, of that of the, uh, the Nazi collaboration, of the Ukrainian nationalists, uh, the mass murder of Poles, Russians, uh, wrong political base Ukrainians, Jews, and, and gypsies, and so on. Yeah, not only this, but uh, for example, about Bandera, a lot of people, a lot, also a lot of journalists start to uh, deny his uh, pro-fascist feeling in his politics because uh, Bandera it's not uh, uh, was not born at in uh, 1941 when the operation Barbarossa started from Nazi Germany no Bandera was uh, very active very uh, dangerous during his permanence in Poland when Galicia the region of Galicia was under po Polish control but nobody want to see his activity during these years, during the 30 years. Uh, why? He was very violent nationalist. He participated in a lot of political murders, also against a member of uh, the Polish government. And he was uh, sentenced for life prison uh, for his participation in the murder of the in, uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs of Poland in 1930. T4, if mm -hmm. uh, I'm not wrong. And he was very strong anti Semitic politicians under the panorama of Ukrainian nationalism. He wrote a lot of pamphlets against Jews, against uh, Pol Polish, and of course against Russian. But it's very interesting that from Polish archives, archives sorry, uh, we can find documents that prove that the most violent actions from the nationalists of Bandera were not against the Russians, but were against Jews and Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. The people that don't accept his form of fascism was, were enemy for him mm -hmm. and his guys. But Absolutely. nobody pretend, nobody wants to speak about it. You know, Baba Yar, uh, people forget, the Germans didn't shoot the Jews of Kiev. They organized that place, but it was Ukrainian nationals who lined up for his volunteers uh, who came and shot and were doing it with great smiles and fanfare, shooting women and children. The Germans only oversaw it. And uh, nobody wants to mention that. They... <laughs> that that's taboo. What, what, what kills me is, uh, it, have you seen the videos out of Israel with uh, uh, Jew, Bandera Jews uh, holding up uh, Bandera flags, singing Bandera songs. I mean, their grandfathers and their grandmothers would have been put in concentration camps by these guys, if not just shot outright. And, and they're celebrating them. It, it, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. And about uh, Babi Yar, for example, there is a, a pure uh, witness of this crime uh, I found a video of, from, uh, I, I, I think it's from eight years, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, in 2016, the USC uh, Shoah Foundation, an American H Institute of uh, the University of California, California for the remembering of uh, uh, the Shoah, uh, put it online. And uh, there is the testify of uh, uh, a Jew, David Eisenberg is the name, uh, that was a, a child during the massacre of Babi Yar, and he's, he said, I remember that the people that are shooting us are not speaking, was not speaking German, but was speaking Ukrainian. Yep. yep. And, and so this is a pure witness of this crime without any poli po political interest, 
without any uh, propaganda interest because uh, this video is on the account of Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is uh, an institute of Israel for the remembering of Shoah. So maybe now it's delete, of course, but in the past years was there, I found, I saved this uh, clip because it's very important for remembering this question. And, uh, you know, now about that there is the this attempt of, for erase all this material from the web for rewrite the history practically they they try there is some forces some center of power that are trying to rewrite like wikipedia for example the history of bandera in all languages they are mm -hmm. trying to uh, erase such material such video from youtube or other platform for hide this truth this is true this is history yeah. history is made by facts not not opinion this is a fact in babi Yar, the people that are shooting people were ukrainians ukrainian nationalists what condemns uh the western powers the most uh in this case was that not only was uh bandera not tried in nuremberg he wasn't tried in any kind of court in fact, when he was assassinated, he was a free man walking around West Germany, living up. And it's Peaceful interesting. Life, mass it's interesting murder. where he chose to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Germany. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, in absolutely. And nobody knows that. There's a whole. There's in a the, mind there. In the British state archive, it's possible to find a lot of document. I'm making in this time a research about it mm -hmm. uh, that uh, testified the cooperation between uh, British military authorities and uh, some vet, some almost all veterans of Ukrainian Waffen SS that that were uh, deported in Italy in a concentration camp in Rimini. And there is a famous document about it. The name is Rimini List, where there is all names of these volunteers. And the British authorities try to help and help a lot of them uh, to leave Italy for Great Britain mm -hmm. in Canada. Uh, in violation of all uh, of all treaties between allies allies and soviet union mm -hmm. that um for for these treaties the um, war uh, prisoner prisoners of war uh, citizen of soviet union were uh, requested to be deported in soviet union for a process as war criminals yeah. but of course the allied forces cannot permit to soviet union to have back these people for example, the same was for uh, Estonian uh, veterans of FNSS. They served as uh, security guards uh, during the Nuremberg process. This is very interesting. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. As security guards. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that, that's, that's an eye opener. I mean, I know about uh, Operation Paperclip where the United States brought in uh, 30,000 uh nazis some of them were scientists so they also oh they were scientists well quite a few of them were uh gestapo uh because they knew the soviet union so they brought in gestapo their family members made them american citizens also forgave secret everything. service uh, member oh. of, of reichswehr uh members of uh, waffen uh, secret id instead of waffen ss uh, um security service and mm -hmm. secret secret service uh a lot of them um, was like hide it by the US, UK yeah. and Western forces uh, generally for because for them was very important. They know how and uh, their anti-Soviet ideology. We, we've we got about seven minutes left uh, on this. And then we, we will do more because there's <laughs> lots, lots to discuss. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, how were you received uh, by people uh, when you arrived? Uh, suspicion, oh. openness? Uh... You know, the, I I was afraid uh, because uh, I, I I thought I'm Italian, I'm citizen of a still country. Uh, maybe I don't know. The police can stop at me. I cannot work. Uh, 
uh, they can consider my me as a spy. But when I come to the administrative border between LNR and uh, uh, the region of Rostov, the, bo uh, the border police uh, asked me for a second contract, second check, of course, because I'm foreign right. journalist. Italian, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when he this man saw my passport, he say, "Why are, are you here?" I explain, "I'm here because I know this topic. I want to show another perspective of uh, this conflict." And he said to me, "Thank you because you are here." I was shocked. And all people, all people in Lugansk, in Donetsk in Zaporozhye, uh, in Kherson. I visited all new territory of Russia, including Crimea. Uh, all people, when I make interview, they said, you are Italian. You are here. You are living here. Thank you. Because you give us, you are giving us the possibility to tell to the world, to the other side, our history, our experience. And this is very important for us. Now, how about uh, back in Italy? How is that being taken? I'm sure that the government's not thrilled. Uh, Meloni's uh, regime isn't too thrilled to have its uh, its position challenged. Um, we discussed before we started this uh, video about a, a local journalist uh, in Italy who's tramping around with the neo-Nazis writing articles against you. Uh, yeah. How, have you had problems with the government? Uh, with so uh, officially, I uh, I'm not under any um, accuse, or uh, they don't change charge me with accusation um, I, or, because I'm not make any crime, of course. But uh, the Italian Parliament make three official questions about my work, uh, about my project uh, in Lugansk for a video bridge between schools, between local schools and Italian schools or about my presence in the Italian embassy in Moscow for a party. Uh, so I'm an Italian citizen. Why is so strange my presence <laughs> in the Italian embassy? I don't know. Uh, and about my work in Donbass. They uh, accuse me to be a propaganda agent or Kremlin agent that want to make like an agit prop in Italy with my activities. But my activity is pure information about what's happened here. Uh, maybe I can, I'm afraid to come back in Italy because uh, the police can block my passport. If the police blo are blocking my passport while I'm in Italy, I can, I can not be able to come back in Russia or mm. in other really? countries. Uh, this is a very dangerous method because for a uh, block a passport it's not needed uh, a sentence by a court it's enough uh, um, the opinion of the director of lock of the state police in the district if the director of the uh, the name is uh, questore or prefetto the prefetto is like the representative of, of the government in, the, in a province. If he said that your passport need to be blocked, the police need to, to block your passport without any sentence. Mm. This is a police measures against crime. It's like a prevention of uh, police measures. And uh, so, for this reason, I prefer to stay here, right. where I where I can work free, and without any danger for my for my safety. But wait, 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 wait! But what you're trying to say is, a Western democracy, a freedom of speech, human rights, and all that would deny journalists the right to speak and tell the truth. I mean, I think, uh, <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you know, I think I think this uh, uh, rhetoric about uh, freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, human rights, it's the best propaganda oh, yeah. that the West mm -hmm. made in the last fifty years. Absolutely. They present themselves as a uh, like uh, defenders of human rights, of freedom of speech, of freedom of press, but when someone 
like uh, Assange, for example, when someone use this use really this freedom of speech and speak about the crimes of the West or the contradiction of the West, now at this moment, this freedom, this right, are not more right, are not more you are not more free of see what do you want or what do you think is right because at this moment you are enemy of the freedom they trans are transforming you in an enemy of the freedom yeah because it's their democracy not your democracy yeah. it's very it, it's very interesting how they uh, they always say that we def we're defending our democracy we get democracy yeah. but you don't because you, you know, know in italy there is a like a war spill uh, that uh, say the Tell what do you want, but tell what we want. Right. As long as you have the same views as we do, you have the freedom of speech to say what you want. As long as it's, yeah, it's, well, in Germany, I mean, they flat out arrest uh, journalists. I've known several uh, who had uh, files charged against them for telling a position that the German government doesn't hold towards Russia and the Donbass. So I mean, that's, they, they just took it one step further. We're almost out of time. And I am I'm sure uh, Andre will uh, come back. We're we're not we're not done yet. There's so much more to talk about. Um, sure. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, uh, and we will be back.